House resume. Very, very, very briefly, just to, to stand in total support of the motion which was moved by my honorable colleague, Honorable Rosen Paul, the Minister for Small Business Development. And I believe that this is yet another example of the government's commitment to creating opportunities of funding for small and medium-sized enterprises. We know, Madam Speaker, that access to financing for many small businesses across the world, the OECS included, is always a challenge. It's always a challenge. And this is why this government, in addition to the presence of the, of the aid bank, and also the presence of the National Development Foundation, both entities which have done a fantastic job in Dominico over the last several decades. But there continues to be a challenge among small and medium-sized enterprises on the basis that they do not have the collateral, the security required to sell those businesses. But what does this government do over the years, Madam Speaker, in response to these challenges which are faced and have been faced by small and medium-sized enterprises for all our existence? First, we created the small business uh, unit, where we, provide, we have provided to date, Madam Speaker, in excess of $13 million by way of grants to many small businesses in Dominica, and many small businesses in Dominica owe their existence and their sustenance and their sustainability because of this measure by the government, Madam Speaker. And we also created the Youth Business Trust for the young people of Dominica. Yes, we have trained young people uh, for the various uh, modules um, at the youth division, but they were never able to transform or to translate those, uh, that training and those business ideas into actual businesses. Why? Because of their inability to access financing. Because as a young person who would have completed high school and gone for this training, you do not have a certificate title. You do not have somebody to take your documents and put in the bank for you and be able to get those loans. The government not only established the youth business trust in name, but also in function. Where the government itself, Madam Speaker, first of all, utilizing grant funding from the government of Venezuela in the past and other benefactors, and also the Citizens by Investment Program, we have put money in the banks. We put money into the banks, and the government is the one guaranteeing the loans for the young people to be able to attract the loans, Madam Speaker. So the gov government has been acting in the first, the first time in the history of our country as a guarantor. So when people talk about, Madam Speaker, what has this government done for people and for young people, there is no more tangible thing you can do for somebody by one, training them, giving them a skill, and secondly, giving them a start in life. Some people call it handouts. I call it, I call it a hand up, Madam Speaker. A hand up, a helping hand, Madam Speaker. Because not all of us are born with a golden spoon in our mouth. Not all of us have access to property, Madam Speaker. There are people who are born with Madam Speaker and there are those who, who, who were not born with it. And unless you're able to give these people a hand, they will not get up to the next step. And this is why, Madam Speaker, I, you know, sometimes get a little bit concerned about the, the way that we discuss things in this country, you know, and the criticism that we give to people. When this government trains somebody, the average, the average undergraduate degree in terms of the government's direct investments to Australia is $200,000. That's what we spend per student. When you take into the consideration tuition, when your tuition is $16,000 US dollars a, a, a semester, a semester, and you have to do eight or ten semesters to get your 120 um, courses, that's a significant, and that's just tuition. That's forgetting about um, housing, forgetting about books for some people. 
And there are students who we also provide airline tickets for because the parents cannot afford it. And so this, Madam Speaker, I have been part of this process at the OECS level from the time its inception. And one of the reasons why we have had to create this regional cooperation, and I would offered to the Central Bank and to the World Bank to use the aid bank to facilitate this project because in the OECS, there is no longer a presence of development banking. Only in Dominica we have something called, like what we have called the aid bank, Madam Speaker. There is no other country in the OECS that has a, a, a bank like the aid bank, a development bank owned by the state that is facilitating investments in various um, spheres of the economy. And this government, Madam Speaker, the aid bank currently has loans given to it straight from the Treasury. Not, I'm, I'm not talking about from the European Investment Bank or from Bandes in Venezuela or from the uh, CDB. I'm talking about funds directly from the government's Treasury to the aid bank to provide loans at lower interest rates to Dominicans, Madam Speaker. The aid bank currently owes the Treasury about $100 million, Madam Speaker. That is what, and that is since I became Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. And when I hear people talking about what this government has done, Madam Speaker, $100 million, 0% interest loan to the aid bank to lend to private sector people. Whether it was monies from the um, Petro Caribbean, that I hear people talking about where the money is, or whether it's from the Citizens for Investment Program, or from the government's own resources because of the way that it has been able to manage the economy. And just think, those of you listening to me, how many of you have contracted a loan from the aid bank in the last 15 years? Because when I became Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, Madam Speaker, there was a proposal from the IMF to close the aid bank. I asked them to come in to assess it because when we came into office, the CDB was not granting loans to the aid bank because they had issues over the governance of the aid bank, the interference of the Minister of Finance and the cabinet in the management and the, and the delivery of loans, and they stopped giving us loans at the, at the, at the aid bank management. Right. And part of the recommendation of the IMF was to close the aid bank, and I said nothing to it. Yeah. There are some parts of the report which I accepted, and there are some parts I said no. And we sat down with the CDB. I went to Barbados, I met them in Jamaica at the annual meeting, I spoke to the leaders of the bank, Mr. Compton Bourne came here, as a matter of fact, I, we even had lunch in Vegas at my aunt's home in 2005. Came in on a Saturday morning to see me in Vegas, Madam Speaker, to speak about the aid bank and resuscitation of the aid bank. And Mr. Compton Bond, the then president of the bank, said to me, we appreciate what you have done and we will resume our business with the aid bank. We have also given loans, Madam Speaker, to the National Development Foundation of Dominica. I believe at 0% interest rate, 0%, in order to lend to the small and medium-sized enterprises in the country at 3 and 4 and 5% compared to the 11 and 12 which they have been accustomed to. When we came as a government in Dominica, Madam Speaker, the interest rates for most of the loans at the aid bank, including student loans, was 11 and 12% at the aid bank. Today, the average, the average loan interest rate at the aid bank is 6%. 6%, Madam Speaker. I am no businessman, Madam Speaker. I am just a village politician. I'm a subsistence farmer who grows little red beans and pink beans to sustain myself, Madam Speaker. But one can appreciate those of you who are business people, those of you who are accountants and, and investors and, and finance people can understand the amount of money we have saved private sector in Dominica by lowering interest rates, by making investment cheaper. Obviously, Madam Speaker, this is a free economy. This is a free economy. We don't control, as a government, Madam Speaker, the levers of the economy. This is a free market economy. And therefore, these institutions must follow certain prudential guidelines. And we must respect that, Madam Speaker. So in respect to this part of before us, Madam Speaker, we decided to participate. It's $5.4 million. $5.4 million invested in cottage industries, invested in small businesses, invested in medium-sized enterprises can go a long way 
in creating a lot of jobs in the economy, ex expanding the economy, Madam Speaker, and generating some export earning, Madam Speaker. Because when I go to for Dominica, I go to Watkinson and I see my friend there who is doing cocoa, a farmer, a young lady doing farming. You know, she grows the cocoa herself, she buys from people, and she rolls it, she has a machine and she rolls it. They export these things to Guadeloupe and Martinique. And I think, Madam Speaker, we need to find a mechanism where we can properly document the number of people who are involved in cottage industries and who are exporting things. Because I believe that the the, the, the statistics are not without capturing the statistics, Madam Speaker. Because a lot of people send these things through the ferry as checked luggage. But these are, these are exports. These are exports bringing in foreign exchange. One euro is three, three dollars and four cents, Madam Speaker. Bringing in and creating employment and creating economic activity. So I think we have to find a mechanism where we can have these things properly reported and channeled so that we can have this um, captured in the economy, Madam Speaker. So we had offered the aid bank to them, but to allow for the aid bank to be used, we'd have to amend the law, and of course there was not a, a full agreement in it because I think, I'm not sure whether the World Bank wants to have its own, you know. Um, so we have to create this entity, Madam Speaker. And we are happy to be here to, in Parliament to ratify the decision of the Minister of Finance in borrowing these monies so that our people can have access to it. We have a representation on the regional cooperation, a local Dominican is representing us on this cooperation. I believe it is um, uh, Mr. Lander, Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson, Stevenson um, Alexander of the Ministry of Small Business. So he'll be representing Dominica's interests on the board, Madam Speaker. And, and, and I think he'll be well placed to represent the government on this board and the people of Dominica. So this is, in fact, Madam Speaker, a, a good news for small and medium-sized enterprises in Dominica, that they now have an additional source. In addition to the uh, NDFD, in addition to the small business unit, in addition to the aid bank, in addition to the business trust, they have another opportunity. And outside of the NDFD, Madam Speaker, outside of the NDFD, there is no other government who has sought to create those, those opportunities for Dominicans to have access to it. And so those of you who have small businesses, when people talking about what this government has done and 19 years and this, we must understand where this country was when this government came into office and where we have placed the man and speak. This cannot be like, you know, a, a father who abandoned a child and go American and come back and surprise his child be. <laughs> he loves a child baby and he's surprised the child big. But so, so you get bigger boy? You big so? But how are you expecting the child grow? But you do not know what the mother had to do to ensure that the child could even survive. And this country, man of speaker, could not pay its bills. We couldn't pay salaries. A salary. Uh, when, a, when a public officer gives you his, his labor in his property. His labor is his property. He's giving it to you. You must compensate him. And when the month comes, you must be in a position to compensate this person for his labor. And we could not do that, Madam Speaker, between 1995 and 2000. And cause many public officers to go in default of their mortgages and their car loans and their land loans, Madam Speaker, because the government was paying late and penalized people. This is why when we had the IMF program and the IMF was saying to us in the cabinet that we should let the payment of salaries be priority number three and priority number four, I said to them, nothing doing. I said to the IMF, nothing doing. I am prepared to end the IMF program, but I will not say to the public servants and Dominicans that you should pay taxes and more taxes, and when the month comes, I cannot pay you your salary, nothing doing. We have to pay and let the payment of salaries be priority number one. Priority number one, Madam Speaker. I think, you know, sometimes the problem of this government, Madam Speaker, and this party, which I have been honored to lead, is that we do not boast about what we have done. We do not speak the gospel according to what we have done. Because people are taking for granted what we have done for this country, Madam Speaker. People forget that we had a, a farm road from Kingfield to the airport. A farm road, single lane. When a vehicle comes in, you have, to, you have to run on the side. And if you're not a driver, you, you, you have your accident. 
and every bridge you have to stop to allow one vehicle to come on. And today we have about 14 bridges with two lane, Madam Speaker, and we have a two lane road from from Saint Rosa to the airport. People forget. People forget, Madam Speaker. People forget that only 7% of all high school graduates had access to the college, which means that 97% of our young people could not see the college before Labour came into office, Madam Speaker. Small business, yes, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Small business, Madam Speaker, telling me, come back to small business. So I'll come back to small business, Madam Speaker. I, I, I respect your ruling, Madam Speaker. So I am happy, Madam Speaker, for, for this. It is, in relative terms, it may not be plenty money, but it is a lot of money, Madam Speaker. $5.4 million can go a long way by on lending a 30,000 here, or 25,000 here. Because that's really what a lot of the small business really need. I met a young boy from Wesley who is involved in seedling production, and he's also involved in actual farming. And all he needs really is, is about, about eighteen to $19,000 to buy some irrigation um, apparatus, Madam Speaker, so he can sustain his business. Something like that would be, would, is, 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 is a blessing for somebody like that, a young boy, disciplined. That's what it is. So, Madam Speaker, I believe it's a great day, and I want to commend the minister and and to thank the World Bank, the World Bank, it, has, uh, is, it continues to be a true partner of Dominica. A true <coughs> partner of Dominica, Madam Speaker. They've always been there with us, but they have been so, more so, Madam Speaker, since Hurricane Maria. And we are grateful to the leadership of the bank. I believe that the vice president of the bank, the new vice president of the bank, is coming to see us um, in May to discuss uh, a number of important issues between the bank and Dominica and between the bank and the wider Caribbean. So I look forward to receiving his delegation uh, in Dominica very soon, Madam Speaker. So I want to give my absolute support. I want to express my excitement um, for this because in my interaction with Dominicans, in my interaction with a number of people who are involved in small businesses, this will go a long way, Madam Speaker, in addressing some of the challenges which they have in accessing additional financing because sometimes they are stretched and they're unable to go to the banks to get the kind of support. And the fact is, Madam Speaker, commercial banking, commercial banking, this is why this is so important. And this is why what the government has done by the creation of the small business unit, by, the, by, the, by providing the aid bank and the NDFD with cheap um, financing, and also the U Business Trust, why these things are so important, Madam Speaker? because it allows for people who otherwise would not have the ability to get loans anywhere, to get it anywhere. And the commercial banks, as I was saying, do not have that kind of interest, do not have that kind of interest in lending to small businesses. They, they rather the, the motor vehicle loan because you have to pay it in, in five years, and they do not have the kind of trust and confidence that they should have in people. Because at the end of the day, they are answerable to shareholders. They are answerable to shareholders, and shareholders are interested only in the bottom line. So I don't, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing to say that what they're doing is wrong or what they're doing is right, Madam Speaker. They have shareholders, and they have to go according to what their shareholders are saying to them. And this is why the aid bank is important. This is why the NDFD is important. This is why the, 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 the Ministry of Small Business is important. This is why the, the, this is very important, Madam Speaker. And this, these things... These things, Madam Speaker, have only been done by us, the Dominican Labour Party, Madam Speaker. And there are hundreds, there are hundreds of small businesses in this country, and I just say thousands of small businesses, Madam Speaker. Without the small business unit, without the, 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 the two percent loans at the aid bank and the zero percent loans which you put at the aid bank, Madam Speaker, we had facilities of zero percent to farmers, zero percent. Loans, 2% loan, Madam Speaker. There is nowhere in the world, Madam Speaker, whether it's a developed country or a developing country, where small business people could have access to these kind of loans. And they are not 
many countries, Madam Speaker, where the government serve as a guarantor, saying to young people, we trust you, we believe in you, you have a good idea, and therefore we will back you and we will guarantee the loan for you, Madam Speaker. And you go to Grafo, where we were last night, Madam Speaker, and this young, um, talented gentleman, Marcus, Madam Speaker, the painter, the artist, he is, Marcus Coffey, he is a product of the New Business Trust. The, the Rasta Brethren in Newtown, the Roy, young, young Roy guy, I believe. What's his name? Um, he, he does the, the garments and so on. Kemai John. Kemai, Madam Speaker, he is a product of the NDF, of the um, Youth Business Trust, Madam Speaker. And there are hundreds of young people. And I can tell them because you go to Kemai in Newtown, and he, he sows. Reggie, you see, you have to lose some weight. They tell you that. You see? Yeah. He sows, Madam Speaker. I mean, I mean, really exquisitely, Madam Speaker. And I think, I think people need to, we need to promote this kind of enterprise, Madam Speaker. Because some of the things that we buy overseas, we are making them right here in Dominica. Right here in Dominica, Madam Speaker. Tony Sponge. Tony Sponge, Madam Speaker, we have to support the local punch. And I met a young lady at the office of Honorable Isaac in, in Stock Farm who we're going to help. A young lady from Focolay who is doing some punches. Top class punch. I must speak, I don't drink, but I know when I see a good punch, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I know when I see a good punch. <laughs> Madam Speaker. You see what I'm saying, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, you know. I can make a tea push for you. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? But I know a good rum when I see it, Madam Speaker. I know a good punch when I see it. And that young lady is making a good punch and we'll help her. So when we speak, Madam Speaker, we're not speaking in the air. We're speaking about our practical interaction with people. Ordinary people, Madam Speaker. Working class people, that's what we do. And this is why our policies and programs come from the people. They come from our, our interaction with the people. And this is why I've always said to the government and to this party that our access to people and people's access to us must be number one. And this is why when I became Prime Minister, Madam Speaker, I opened the doors of the Prime Minister to people. Because my job, my job is about people, Madam Speaker. It's not about the files I have on my desk and letters from all sorts of organizations in the world. Those things are part of it, yes. But fundamentally, my job as Prime Minister is about people and ensuring that I can hear from people about their struggles, their fears, their aspirations, their dreams, and to see how we can allay their fears and how we can give them hope and how we can assist them by giving them a helping hand. The thousands of young people we have sent to study since we came into office could not have gone to Manus because if we did not interact with them directly and they had no access to us, because we know how things go on in the country before Madam Speaker. Is who you knew. But now it is everybody, Madam Speaker. All shall eat. Yeah. All shall be educated. Yeah. All shall have decent housing, Madam Speaker. So even when they're trying to criticize us for housing, Madam Speaker, I could have, we could have built 5,000 homes since Hurricane Maria and house everybody, Madam Speaker, by giving everybody T111 and 2x2 and some nails. But we said no. We want to give everybody in Dominica a resilient home, a home that they can feel comfortable in if we are faced by a hurricane. And that is why we, that's what we're doing. Next week, there is 66 families in Cassie Bruce who will get letters saying, you are given a home. 66 families, and if on average, these families have three people in a home, do your maths. That's the impact these homes are going to have on the village of Cassie Bruce, Madam Speaker. All over the country, building resilient homes that you can only see, Madam Speaker, you will see in London and in Manhattan. Almost looking like a Trump Tower, Madam Speaker, some of them. That's right. Comfortable homes. Well, so whether you are middle class or... Three minutes left. I don't, it's okay. It's okay. Whether you are middle class or you are working class, Madam Speaker, we bring everybody up. We bring everybody up. We bring everybody up, and that's what we're going to do. Build homes for people, everybody, 
so that you can have a sense of pride, you can have the comfort, and you can have the safety in your own man and speaker. With this very, very short intervention, Madam Speaker, I, come, I want to support wholeheartedly this measure. And when people question, Madam Speaker, finally, Madam Speaker, when people question, well, what, is the what is the urgency in this? What is the emergency in this? These are people who do not understand how people live in Dominica. These are people who do not understand it. So what is in 5.4 million dollars you for to come to Parliament in an emergency? People want access to money. And why should I wait? Why should this parliament wait, Madam Speaker, for next year or year after next to come to the parliament? When it could come to parliament, Madam Speaker, what is parliament, what are parliamentarians doing today that they should come in parliament, Madam Speaker? When you meet, they, they, they don't want to meet. When you don't meet, why not meet it? <laughs> but they see no urgency in this. They see no urgency, Madam Speaker, in coming to the Parliament to ensure the police and their families can have medical insurance, Madam Speaker. They see no emergency in this. And I gave a commitment to the police when I met with them, Madam Speaker. I told them, as, as long as you agree to the amendment, if I have to go to Parliament in an emergency sitting, I will move to the Parliament to pass legislation to give the cabinet and the government the authority to enter into an agreement with the new insurance company. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So if you see no emergency or urgency in ensuring that the police who are out there on the seas, in the mountains, in the streets, protecting us as a nation, and to ensure that when they go out, they know that their family, if their family falls sick, they, can, they, they, they are assured medical insurance, if you see no urgency in this, then what is this? You can come here and play politics, but I don't play politics with people's health and people's education. I don't play politics with that. This is why we have never not helped anybody irrespective of their political affiliation where health is concerned. And what is the urgency emergency? What is it? That's, these things are important to people. Important to people, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, thank you. Madam Speaker, I stand to... Um, <laughs> round up the wrap-up the debate on um, sorry, sorry, on the resolution. The Prime Minister have indicated all of the benefits of this project. We as a government continue to invest in our people and this facility is one other one is one other that will allow or MSMEs to benefit and to address a very critical issue or challenge that continue to that they continue to face, which is access to finance and to affordable financing. This project, in fact, will contribute to them and to the economy, the expansion of economy. A lot of the work that we continue to do at the ministry and as a government is to ensure that small businesses have the technical financial uh, support that they need to create livelihoods not only for themselves but to increase employment for others and we've seen that being done very well by many of our msmes the prime minister identified just a few but we can count hundreds of young people that have benefited from the various programs and policies of this government. And this is one other step in that direction. And um, we are on a drive to increase agro-processing manufacturing. The potential is great. And just last week, in fact, we had a, a small showcasing of our enterprises in, at the Ross University. 
And it is really tremendous, the growth that we've seen in MSMEs. And we know that it can expand much more. And this project will offer us one other opportunity to do so. Um, as we seek as well to get many of our MSMEs export ready, that they can contribute to increase foreign exchange earnings. So with these few words, I want to once again state the importance and submit for the approval of cabinet, of parliament, sorry. Be it resolved that in accordance with Section 3.1 of the Loans Act, Chapter 6405 of the 1990 Revised Laws of the Commonwealth of Dominica, this Honorable House authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow, by means of credit, a sum not exceeding 1,400,000 special drawing rights, 1,400,000 or equivalent to 2 million United States dollars and Eastern Caribbean equivalent $5,400,000. Service charge, three quarter of 1% per annum. Commitment charge, half percent of one, no, half of 1% per annum. And repayment, 40 years, including 10 years Greece, February 15th and August 15th each year, starting February 15th, 2028. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The eyes have it. The motion has been carried. Second and third reading of bills. Madam Speaker, I move the second reading of the bill shortly entitled Offshore Banking Amendment Act 2019. Madam Speaker, In January 2019, the Honorable Prime Minister and Leader of this House presented to Parliament, or to this Parliament, amendments to the Offshore Banking Act No. 8 of 1996. The amendments made were to meet the requirement, requirements sorry, of the European Union, EU, in regard to the criteria and conditions that were set by the EU in respect to matters on tax transparency and governance. Madam Speaker, at the time the amendments were, were made, the draft bills were submitted to the EU Tax Secretariat, as well as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, otherwise known as OECD Tax Secretariat. However, Madam Speaker, feedback was not provided by the OECD Tax Secretariat. It should be noted that one of the criterion set by the European Union is that countries must join the OECD's Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, otherwise known as BEPS. According to the OECD, the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Initiative seeks to close gaps in international taxation for companies that allegedly avoid taxation or reduce the tax burden in their home country by engaging in tax inversions or by migrating intangibles to lower tax jurisdictions. Dominica was invited to join the BEPS, Madam Speaker. Joining the, the BEPS initiative comes with another set of conditions that must be achieved. In that regard, the OECD Tax Secretariat requires that the grandfathering clause included in the recent amendment should come to an end earlier. Specifically, a change from December 2021 as stated in Clause 6 of the Amendment Act of No. 1 of 2019 to June of 2021. 
This, Madam Speaker, is the amendment being proposed by this bill. Madam Speaker, government is committed to taking all the action necessary to ensure that Dominica does not remain on a negative list and that Dominica is not deemed to be uncooperative in tax matters. Government is definitely not opposed to the principles of transparency and good governance in respect of tax matters. But truth be told, Madam Speaker, the demands placed on small states in regard to these matters are indeed onerous. Moreover, Madam Speaker, the varying standards and the frequent changes in standards take little account of the capacity constraints of small developing countries. Government, however, Madam Speaker, con will continue to do its best to respond as these demands are made. With these few words, Madam Speaker, I recommend the Offshore Banking Amendment Bill for the consideration of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The bill is now before the House for debate. Madam Speaker, I didn't turn my light off and I suspected that there wasn't going to be any need to, and indeed there was not. Madam Speaker, the bill is short. Um, it's before, before the House. It is simply a change from December 2021 to June of 2021. Uh, Madam Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. Now stands committed to a committee of the whole House to be considered close by close. The bill shortly entitled the Offshore, Amendment, the Offshore Banking Amendment Act of 2019 passed the committee without any amendment. The question is that the report of the committee on the bill be adopted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Madam not, Speaker. No, not yet, not yet. Third, third reading. Apologies, apologies Madam Speaker. Um, third reading. Third reading. Uh, Madam Speaker, I beg to move that the, the bill entitled Offshore Banking Amendment Act 2019 be read a third time and passed. Second, no. Madam Speaker. Read it, read it. The, first of all, the bill wasn't read the second time, you know. Um, um, Mr. James, you didn't read it the second time. So, no, um, oh no, I had to first say, yes, wait, read, yes. Let's back up a bit, uh-huh. No, after that, is, I'm right. It, it has been gone through the second. It's the third reading. So it, you have to read now, Mr. James, for the third reading. Offshore Banking Amendment Act 2019. The bill has been read a third time and passed accordingly. Madam Speaker, I move the second reading of the bill shortly entitled International Business Companies Amendment Act 2019. Second. Madam Speaker, I present to the House 
a bill to amend the International Business Companies Act No. 10 of 1996. This amendment is similar to the one made to the Offshore Banking Act to fulfill the requirements of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, that is the BEPS initiative. As previously indicated, Dominica was required to join the BEPS to meet the European Union tax requirements and as a member of the BEPS framework, there are conditions which must be met. In January 2019, amendments were made to the IBC Act and with these amendments, concessions granted to the IBCs would cease for all companies incorporated after 31st December 2018. For companies that were already incorporated at 31st December 2018, the concession would cease by December 2021. Under the BEPS framework, the OECD requires that the concession cease by June 2021. Madam Speaker, the proposal before the House is to simply make that change so that the grandfather cl grandfathering clause would terminate at June 2021 instead of December 2021. Madam Speaker, I therefore commend the International Business Companies Amendment Act of 2019 for the consideration of Parliament. Thank you. The bill is now before the House for debate. Madam Speaker, I, I didn't expect any major debate because that's a simple matter. Madam Speaker, and I think on the government side, we are fully aware as to the implication for ensuring that this bill is actually passed in this Honorable House, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled International Companies Amendment Act. No, no, no. We have no, to no, go. Okay. We have to go to the committee. We have to go committee mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled International Business Companies Amendment Act of 2019 be read a second time. Those in favour. Those against, the eyes have it. International Business Com Companies Amendment Act 2019. The bill now stands committed to a committee of the whole house to be considered clause by clause. Bill shortly entitled the International Business Companies Amendment Act of 2019 passed the committee stage without amendment. The question is that the report on the committee on the bill be adopted. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Okay. Madam Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled International Business Companies Amendment Act of 2019 be read a third time and passed. It has been moved and somebody seconded. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled the International Business Companies Amendment Act of 2019 be read a third time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The bill will now be read a third time. International Business Companies Amendment Act 2019. 
The bill has been read a third time and passed accordingly. Madam Speaker, I move the second reading of the bill shortly entitled Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information, Common Reporting Standard Act 2019. Madam Speaker, the Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information or Common Reporting Standard Act is proposed to the Parliament to give the force of law to the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters. Madam Speaker, the Government of Dominica was required to sign on to the Convention in keeping with its commitments to the international community in respect to certain principles and practices related to tax matters. The background to this convention is the same as for the previous bills that were presented, namely the Offshore Banking Act and the International Business Companies Act. It is that the member states of the Council of Europe and the member countries of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, have considered that the development of international movement of persons, capital, goods, and services has increased the possibilities of tax avoidance and evasion, and therefore requires increased cooperation among tax authorities. According to the OECD Secretariat, the Convention facilitates international cooperation for a better operation of national tax laws while respecting the fundamental rights of taxpayers. The Convention provides for all possible forms of administrative cooperation between states in the assessment and collection of taxes, in particular with a view to combating tax avoidance and evasion. This cooperation ranges from exchange of information, including automatic exchanges, to the recovery of foreign tax claims. Madam Speaker, participating countries and financial institutions operating within participating countries are therefore required to provide information on clients and taxpayers when requested by another participating country. After approval by the OECD Secretariat, Dominica was invited to sign the Convention and this signing took place on the 25th of April 2019. Having signed the Convention, it is necessary now to give legal effect to the agreement. Madam Speaker, there are 19 clauses to this Act. The signed Convention is the first schedule of the Act. The second schedule outlines guidelines for common standards on reporting and due diligence for financial in information. Sorry, for financial account information. I will summarize the content of the bill in line with the objects and reasons contained in the bill, which was circulated. Clause 1 provides for the short title. Clause 2 is the interpretation clause in which a number of words and terms used in the bill are defined. Clause 3 provides for the Convention to have the force of law in Dominica. Clause 4 provides for the Act and the agreement to take precedence in the event of their inconsistency with any other law. Clause 5 provides for the Minister to amend the text of the Convention, which is the first schedule of the Act, by order published in the Gazette. Clause 6 provides for the functions and powers of the competent authority. The competent, competent authority is required to administer and enforce compliance with the Convention, the Act and regulations made under the Act. In accordance with this clause, the competent authority is authorized to delegate any power or duty conferred on him by the Act or regulations. Clause 7 requires a reporting financial institution to submit annual returns to the competent authority in relation to any reportable account that is maintained by the reporting financial institution. Clause 8 addresses the issue of confidentiality. A law relating to confidentiality would not apply to the disclosure of information by a reporting financial institution to the competent authority if the information is required to be included in a return to be completed by a financial institution. 
It also requires a person who has an official duty or is employed in the administration or enforcement of the convention to treat as confidential information received from a reporting financial institution, a participating jurisdiction, or a competent authority of another jurisdiction under an agreement. Clause 9 provides for penalties for failure to make a return, making a false statement or omission in respect of information required to be included in a return and failing to comply with the requirement of the competent authority. Clause 10 provides that the liability to a penalty under Section 9 does not arise if a person satisfies the competent authority or a court of competent jurisdiction that there is a reasonable excuse for the failure. Clause 11 requires the competent authority to assess the penalty and notify the person liable of the assessment. Clause 12 confers a right to appeal against a penalty. Clause 13 specifies the procedure to be adopted to appeal against the penalty. Clause 14 provides for the enforcement of a penalty and would require the, the person liable to the penalty to pay the penalty within 30 days after the date of notification under Section 11 or the date of final determination or withdrawal of an appeal. Clause 15 would protect from suit the competent authority and any person employed in carrying out the provisions of or having any official duty under the Act or the Convention who exchanges information in accordance with the Convention. Clause 16 provides that a person who enters into an arra any arrangement or engages in a practice to avoid an obligation imposed under the Act or regulations made under the Act is subject to the obligation as if the person had not entered into the arrangement or engaged in the practice. Clause 17 provides that a person who makes a false statement or omission in respect of any information required to be included on a return under the Act or under the reg regulations is guilty of an offence. Clause 18 provides for the amendment of the second schedule by order published in the Gazette. And Clause 19, Madam Speaker, authorizes the Minister for Finance to make regulations. Madam Speaker, the government understands the implications of not being in, in compliance with the standards set by the international community. We, however, we, we are, however, concerned that these standards change too frequently. There is a significant cost associated with compliance. We are also concerned that even when groups of, of countries, such as the OECD and the EU, indicate that they will take a unified position on matters such as taxation. Individual countries belonging to these organizations still take unilateral action against third countries, such as our own in some instances. This government is also of the view that the countries of the region should be more unified in their response on these matters. Notwithstanding, Madam Speaker, these concerns, I reiterate the government's commitment to keeping the undertaking that it has given. We are hopeful that the international community will recognize the efforts that we have made and are continuing to make to ensure compliance. We are hopeful too that with the signing of this agreement, Dominica will be removed from the negative list. Madam Speaker, I commend, commend the bill to this parliament. The bill is now before the House for debate. Madam Speaker, just for a short intervention. This government, Madam Speaker, has had a history of cooperating with regional and international agencies, organizations, and countries. When it comes to the issue of security, and the issue of uh, fighting terrorism and the issue of putting the legislative and the institutional framework in place to deal with issues of money laundering, Madam Speaker. And when you go back to the hands of this parliament, you will see a plethora of amendments and new legislation which this government has brought into this parliament many of which are on its own volition and some based on its commitment to international regional communities. 
And what we have been saying to the international community, and this is across the CARICOM, is that the goalposts keep shifting too frequently. Let us do a comprehensive assessment of what is required and let us come up with a comprehensive list of recommendations on how we as a global community can treat with these things. As it is now, that they also have too many entities dealing with the same issues. And even within those entities, Madam Speaker, there are countries which go on its own, on their own, to demand certain things and to impose certain things. And the with small jurisdictions like ours in the CARICOM, with units in the Attorney General's Office and the Ministry of Finance and, and others who have to deal with this, you always have very few people. Most Aegis chambers in the OECS, for example, if you have two parliamentary draftsmen um, uh, in, in the public service, you have many. And parliamentary draftsmen would have to go through all of these requirements and to prepare it and to ensure it can come to the Parliament, one, in accordance with what is required, and secondly, in accordance with the Constitution of our country. And sometimes the time that they give you to make these changes, not even the developed world can make those changes in the time frame which they are allowing to happen. In Dominica's case, for example, the entire world, including the European Union and the OECD, recognize that they made an error in placing Dominica on the so-called blacklist or the negative list for having done everything that was required of it. We passed all of the legislation. We did all of the amendments to the law. We put the institutional framework in place. And the only thing which decided why they placed us on this negative list or the so-called blacklist was a decision which was required by them, that is, to allow Dominica to be, to be a signatory to the convention. They had not responded to us in the affirmative, notwithstanding dozens of emails and numerous correspondences from the government to them and also from our ambassador in, in Brussels. They did not respond. And I can tell you, Madam Speaker, that we did not take this lying down. We, we wrote very strongly and sternly to the authorities in Europe, and every opportunity I had to engage a European government, a representative of the European government, I told them precisely how the people of Dominica felt. And I believe, in large measure, it is because of those interventions by the government where it went on an offensive in this, in this matter, and, 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 and we support the CARICOM and the OECS, and many of our, of our prime minister, colleague prime ministers within CARICOM and the OECS, who really stood with us. And I single out in that case the prime minister of St. Lucia, for example. You know, they eventually and quickly responded to us and said, well, we have taken a decision for you to accede to the convention, and please come and sign it and so forth. And therefore, it was signed on April 25th. But we already signed since last year, even before the hurricane. And if I had to fly to Paris, Madam Speaker, I would have gone to Paris to sign it myself. But I can't, we can't sign this stuff before they agree. And we had this legislation, Madam Speaker, ready in anticipation of a favorable response from them back then, we had the legislation. But we could not come to the parliament with the legislation unless they tell us, well, we agree, and what are the terms and conditions of the agreement, so that those can be factored into the legislation that is before us today. And I have always said to Dominicans, yes, there are things that we have to fight between and among ourselves with a partisanship clothing. But there are some things in this region, and there are some things in our country, that we have to recognize that it transcends party politics. It transcends party politics. Because when our country gets into this negative list, 
It is not Roosevelt's territory, nor the Dominican Labour Party. It is Dominica. And these things have the potential of impacting the way we conduct business within our country and between countries and with countries. It will affect how we deal with issues of banking. It will affect how we deal with issues of money transfers. It will affect our, our ability to pay those whom we owe, both in the public service and private sector people. It will affect our credit, credit card access to credit cards and debit cards. So people have to understand these things and recognize that this is not about UWP or Dominican Labour Party. This is about our country. And our country is, is facing, like all of the countries, developing countries in the world, are facing some monumental tax. And the, as I always said, we are small fries. We are sprats, or what you call kai, in a deep blue ocean, Madam Speaker, surrounded by sharks and whales. But the United States told them, and rightly so, even when they tried to impose this very thing, same thing on the United States, they told them, you, you have no jurisdiction over the United States. We won't agree with that. And we're not passing any legislation. And if you pass any legislation to impose anything on the United States, we'll go to our Congress and pass a legislation to impose things on you. But we don't have that, that, that power. We don't have power. So all we do in this country, Madam Speaker, is watch and pray, you know. Watch and pray to our Lord to protect us and guide us through this very difficult world. Because we do not have the, the um, civil authorities to deal with the issue. So we have to now go, we have to go beyond the civil authorities and to seek the spiritual intervention. And I must say, Madam Speaker, notwithstanding how difficult the world is and how difficult some people are making the world for us as small countries, the Lord has been good to us, Madam Speaker. And the Lord continue to watch over us. Because with all of these recessions in the world, with all of these natural disasters that we have had, 2010 a natural disaster, 2013 a natural disaster, 2015 a natural disaster, 2017 a disaster that no way in the world has seen, and we're still standing in Dominica, man and speak. We're still standing in Dominica, and we owe it in full measure, man and speak in full measure to the good Lord, Madam Speaker, and to guiding us to resources and to allowing us, as small as the resources may be, to have access to it so we can have people to have jobs, keep jobs. And look at this, you know. With this disaster, man, all of these successive disasters, successive disasters, not one public servant has been sent home. Even those who were temporary for some weeks before the hurricane, Madam Speaker. Not one. And not one has, been, has received his salary late. And we're taking these things for granted. We're taking these things for granted. We're taking this for granted. And all I say to people is, Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they're saying. Because the way this world is these days. And I also say to people that countries no longer help you because you have diplomatic relations with them. It boils down to one thing. Friendship. And if you think what I'm saying doesn't make sense, look at all of us who have neighbors and so on. How many of us know our neighbors? How many of our neighbors bring a, a, a frozen joist for us on Sunday? Or, or, or a cup of jello? Everybody stays in their house, man, because the only friends you go by and, and at Christmas time, what does Christmas come these days to? The world has changed, it has gotten more difficult. And if you do not know how to navigate this world, and if you do not have friends that you can call by telephone or send a WhatsApp to them and say, my brother, I, you know, we have a difficulty here, I, I need some help, can you help me? You have a problem. And 
I am concerned because there are many people in this country who are taking everything that we have now for granted, as if they were there before we came into office. Farmers may make noise for money about this, this 10,000 or 3,000, but the only farmers who will get money when a disaster strike will ban the farmers. Why? Because they will have insurance. How many houses were built and how many homes were fixed after Hurricane, Hurricane David and Hurricane Allen? We got a few pieces of green hats from Guyana, from Forbes Burnham, and, 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 and if you are not a friend of the leadership of the country, then you get nothing. And people, when you spend a hundred million dollars to help you fix the homes, as if well, there's entitlement, the, you know, the government holding insurance for you. The government is only doing this because within the government, within the party, they, we understand people. We have a certain benevolence, we have a certain, for a certain, certain com, I mean, care and compassion for people's, and people's struggles. And had it not been for the government's intervention, the majority of Dominicans would not be able to cover their homes because people lost everything they own. Everything they own. And we are dealing with all of these hurricane-related issues and recovery, Madam Speaker, and at the same time have to be dealing with the international community on these issues, which occupy your time. Which occupy a lot of your time. As a matter of fact, Madam Speaker, I have said to the Cabinet that we may have to bring in a special team of people to be resident in the Ministry of Finance or the Attorney General's office to deal exclusively with these things. We need, we need lawyers and financial advisors to be just, just resident to deal with all those requirements because it is very tedious work and very demanding. And notwithstanding the fact that we have to deal with all those issues, we still make them for people. And people think people behave as if we always had those things. And those things will always be there. Likewise, people criticize the health system. Yes, you, everywhere you go, you'll have a challenge with the health system. Everywhere you go, you might, you, you stay in America or Guadeloupe or France, you may have to stay three hours before you see a doctor because the doctor's seeing other people. the improvement that has been made to the health system. Before 2005, we did not have an I ICU in Dominica. And men talking as if, well, we had this big hospital in Dominica called the PMH, and, and Kerry come and he mash it up, and there's no more hospital in Dominica. A hospital was built in, in what, 1944, after the, after the Second or the Third World War, which we did. Today, we can boast of 99% of the specialists who are, who are, who are providing health care to us are Dominicans trained by us. <laughs> trained by us. And Medication which you will not be able to be given free in even developed countries, we give it to you free in the health system in Dominica. So while there will always be challenges in everything, but we must not lose sight of the progress we have made and the distance we have traveled. And I say to people, because we boast we are Christians, but we cannot boast about Christians because we come to church. It has to be in practice. And people, I keep telling people, when you criticize me, you know, I am just a, an instrument. I'm just a vessel. But when we criticize the good that we have in our country, we're really criticizing the one who really gives it to us. And I don't understand how it is that our pastors, because we have more pastors than now than we had before, I don't know how they cannot pass it to the people so people have a better appreciation for these things. No, I have to be, as Prime Minister, now be even like I'm a pastor.
or a priest or a lay minister or, or what do you call him after the priesthood? Deacon. The tax benefit. People talk about as this country as if we are we have seven million population and four million paying forty percent of your tax. But the fact is, because of the changes we have made in the tax regime in Dominica, the majority of working people don't pay tax, and those who pay pay very little. And the person who works the least hardest in the country pays the most tax, that is me. But, but because of the changes we made, people are able to take more money home, their own money to decide what they want to do with it. Obviously, some people are not managing the money properly and you have to watch how we go about in, 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 encountering and committing ourselves as individual families and households. We have to watch this and understand that this is a small country with huge challenges, you know, recovering from a natural disaster. And this government has single-handedly, single-handedly been responsible for the cleaning, the clearing, the feeding, the housing of people in Dominica. Even with this, for example, the dredging, I keep saying, I mean, this gives me a headache every month. But you don't see the, the monies flowing in the rivers. But without that intervention, many of our properties and lives in Dominica would be at risk. Over a hundred million dollars, Madam Speaker. But if you do not dredge the Roseau River, what will happen to Roseau and the businesses? If you do not dredge Pishna, what would happen to the families in Pishna? If you do not dredge the Castle Comfort River, what will happen to the properties in Castle Comfort? If you do not go and dredge Portsmouth, the Indian River, and at some chance, and one mile, what will happen to Portsmouth as we saw? What will happen to Chackall and all the wonderful properties there as we've seen the rivers wash away these very expensive homes? You have three minutes left. All of this area does. All of these areas, Madam Speaker, every one of you who are living along the river, below the river, on top of the river, alongside the river, Madam Speaker, you are benefiting from this massive investment on the dredging of rivers. But people will see these things. They will see the money flowing. Because if we could see the money flowing, and all of us, even if we can't swim, we'd be jump, we'd jump in the river and try to collect the money. But I really wish we could see the money flowing so we could jump and take some of it. These are the things that we are doing and we have done while battling with these things on a daily basis. You wonder, Madam Speaker, I'm sure you're wondering the way you're looking so pensive. You're wondering, well, where do we get all this time? Because we only have 24 hours a day. To do these things. And I think too that the international community has to be a little bit more understanding of the challenges which small countries are going to face. And at the same time, Madam Speaker, we spend an enormous amount of money as a region, as a country, protecting those countries from drugs coming from South America. Because the fact is, Madam Speaker, 99% of the drugs which come through our countries go up to Europe and North America. And we spend a lot of money because we recognize that we don't only have an obligation to our children in Dominica, we have an obligation to children anywhere in the world. And to ensure that we can interdict those drugs coming from the region so that they do not go and affect and destroy families in North America and Europe. Who, do, who, do, who, who pays us for that? What you get in return, a blacklisting, negative listing? That's not nice. That's not how good friends behave. That's not how neighbors behave. 
Neighbors have to be empathetic. So this is the, the, the whole Time. difficult, Madam Speaker, the world has come. And so we are passing this, this bill, we have to be passing the Parliament, and I look forward <laughs> to the European Union doing the honourable and just thing to remove us from this negative list, ASAP, Madam Speaker. And, and, and look forward to that because that is the only just thing they should do. As a matter of fact, they should even go publicly and apologise to Dominica for having placed us on this negative list, Madam Speaker. We don't want an apology. We don't want an apology. All we want, take out one of them from this, this, this black place because we have done everything and we have gone beyond Your what is required. Is what is required by the international community, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I, it doesn't leave much for me to say. I think the, the bill. Uh, its importance, its necessity, and the challenges that uh, the country of Dominica has experienced and is likely to continue to experience as a result of the need to make these types of amendments is clear uh, from what has been said in the debate so far. Madam Speaker, I simply uh, conclude by commending the bill to the House. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled the Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information Common Reporting Standard of 2019 be read a second time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The bill will now be read a second time. Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information Common Reporting Standard Act 2019. The bill now stands committed to a committee of the whole House to be considered clause by clause. House resumes and I have to report that the bill shortly entitled the Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information Common Reporting Standard Act of 2019 passed the committee stage without amendment. The question is that the, the report of the committee on the bill be adopted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Mm. Madam Speaker, I move. Forgive me. I move that the bill 
shortly entitled Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information, Common Reporting Standard Act 2019, be read a third time and passed. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled the Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information, Common Reporting Standard Act of 2019, be read a third time and passed. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The bill will now be read a third time. Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information, Common Reporting Standard Act 2019. The bill has been read a third time and passed accordingly. Madam Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled the Police Amendment Act 2019 be read a first time. Madam Speaker, I move that the Police I think I move that the bill shortly entitled the Police Amendment Act 2019 be read a second time. Second. Madam, Speaker, the, Madam Speaker, the government of Dominica is mandated by law to provide free medical and surgical coverage to police officers. In keeping with this mandate, Madam Speaker, the Police Act was amended by Act Number 1 of 1997 to provide insurance for police officers. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, this amendment had the effect of binding the Commonwealth of Dominica to One Health and Group Life Insurance Scheme and Company. It provided no flexibility to police officers or the state to seek insurance scheme with any other company. Madam Speaker, over time, it became apparent that this insurance scheme could not adequately provide the needs of police officers and covered under this plan, especially after the company was under judicial management. Madam Speaker, let me emphasize to this honorable house that notwithstanding, at no time were police officers left uncovered. Madam Speaker, this government has a short ongoing dialogue on this particular issue with the Police Welfare Association. This bring us, brings us, Madam Speaker, to this amendment that is currently being presented to this Honorable House. Madam Speaker, this short but powerful amendment will have the effect of ensuring collaboration among the Police Welfare Association, the Chief of Police, the Minister responsible for Police, the Minister for Finance to come up with the best possible scheme of insurance for police officers at any one given time. This section is sufficiently flexible to ensure that the government of Dominica can provide full and proper coverage to police officers and their dependents and significant others at all times. Madam Speaker, the Police, the police Amendment Bill 2019 comprises three main section. Section 3 of this Amendment Act, Madam Speaker, um, amends Section 3 of Section 10 of the Police Act by deleting subsection 1 and subsection 2 and replacing them with the sections outlined. This section, this section outlines that the subject, this section, Madam Speaker, indicates that subject to consultation with the Police Welfare Association, the Commissioner of Police, the Minister responsible for the Police, The Minister for Finance, be by, means, by, be by means of a group insurance and a group life insurance scheme, seek your health and insurance services in respect of police officers. Section, two, subsection, section 10, subsection 2, places the owners on buying directly to the selective insurance company the premiums and costs associated with the health insurance coverage outlined in the previous section on the government of Dominica. A new subsection 5 is inserted in the Act and outlines that the permanent secretary responsible for the police will represent the government for the purposes of section, subsection 1. Madam Speaker, this government is the government for the police. 
And this bill signifies, Madam Speaker, the commitment of the government in improving the lives and conditions of police officers and ensuring that the police officers and the families are treated with, with measures of dignity befitting the difficulty of the task that they have to perform. Madam Speaker, I therefore commend this short but very profound bill to the Son of the House, Madam Speaker. The bill is now before the House for debate. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I just rise I, to... I understand why you're out of your seat, so I will oh, give you permission. Yeah, Speaker, to... I, I, I know, and, and I know. Okay. My eyesight is not very good, but... Oh, it, okay. yeah, I need to check those chairs. So she's not my weight, Madam Speaker, as a chair. That's a problem. <laughs> My question is, how, how do we make the arrangement to... No, I can stand. I don't have to sit. No, 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 I don't have to, to sit. To repair right. the chair, I'm talking about. Uh, the chair? <laughs> no, check them and we'll do an assessment on the chairs and we'll decide how to go forward. With, okay, with it. okay. So can I stay here, Madam Speaker? Yes, 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 yes. No, Madam Speaker, I just want to make a, a, a short contribution to the debate in support of the measure before this House. And I say so, Madam Speaker, because I've had uh, two brothers in the police force, Madam Speaker, the one before me and one after me. So I might well have been a police officer myself, except, Madam Speaker, I chose a different call in life. I mean, my friends, Madam Speaker, went to school and um, they're police officers because at the time, Madam Speaker, that was the in thing. These opportunities that we have today to be other things were not really a present at the time, cost prohibitive, we couldn't afford education. It seems the advent of this government, Madam Speaker, that um, education and, and, and food and learning has become so, so easy and the Prime Minister said that we take it for granted. But many of us, Madam Speaker, who would have loved to do other things when we, we left school, our parents could not afford, uh, expensive, the opportunities were not there, scholarships were not as freely available as, as they are today, Madam Speaker. Um, and this government has made it possible that many of us can move into, in, into other fields, Madam Speaker. But, Madam Speaker, the police, as we all know, play a very important role, Madam Speaker, a very important role uh, in the uh, securing of life and property and, and security of the state, Madam Speaker. And so I believe that anything that this government can do, or any government can do, to make the working condition of the police and the life of the police uh, much simpler and easier, Madam Speaker, um, would be welcome. Um, Madam Speaker, what we do as a, as a country, we, we have to have an appreciation for uh, the work of the police. And we should not in any way attempt to put no pressure, Madam Speaker, on the police in the execution of their duties. And Madam Speaker, while we provide this insurance, none of us would like to see that insurance being used because we would like our policemen to be always fit and healthy and, and their families well taken care of. And so, Madam Speaker, we have to ensure that we try as much as we can not to expose our police officers to unnecessary dangers and unnecessary uh, challenges, Madam Speaker, that could force them into uh, having to make use, Madam Speaker, of, of this facility. And so, Madam Speaker, I, I believe that we're not trying hard enough, Madam Speaker, to make the life of police officers, Madam Speaker, a little easier, Madam Speaker. We are, Madam Speaker, numerous times when what you call false alarm, that the police have, been, have to be called out like late nights in the rain, in the sun, because of threats of blockages here and, and, and blockages there. For no apparent reason, Madam Speaker, airport being blocked and policemen have to be out there at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning to ensure that the state um, assets are, are secured, Madam Speaker. We have had instances, Madam Speaker, where policemen have to be called out to unnecessary situations, Madam Speaker, uh, a blockage of roads and, 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 and stones and, 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 and firebombs, Madam Speaker, which is totally unnecessary, Madam Speaker, to fulfill somebody's ego or, or just to probably cause, cause problems, Madam Speaker. Saturday morning, people going about their normal business, you know, policemen have to be called out and, and with tear gas and, 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 and that sort of thing, Madam Speaker. I believe all these, Madam Speaker, are issues which would raise the, 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 the call, Madam Speaker, and make the issues of, of, of insurance, Madam Speaker, uh, more pressing and, and of, of, of greater concern to our police officers, Madam Speaker. And Speaker, there are instances when we call for action 
Uh, we put no measures in place to, to, to control those actions, Madam Speaker. And so the policemen have to be called out, Madam Speaker, on duty to ensure that peace and security is prevailing in this country, Madam Speaker. And to my mind, on many instances, it's totally unnecessary, Madam Speaker, and uncalled for. But more importantly, Madam Speaker, we have to encourage the public to have respect for the police and to appreciate the work of the police, Madam Speaker. Yep. <clears throat> and, 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 Madam Speaker, we have to be careful that we, not, we do not incite situations that can bring our police officers under unnecessary pressure and under unnecessary dangers, Madam Speaker. And our call should always be that the police, Madam Speaker, because their role is not just, just, just to protect life and property, but their presence, Madam Speaker, is also a deterrent to crime. And, and, and we have to give our police officers the comfort that the entire country respects and appreciates the work, the work that they do, Madam Speaker. And so we need to call on our citizens, Madam Speaker, to respect the police and to be friends of the police like they were in the, in the old days, Madam Speaker. In the old days, the police was the friend of the community. And we used to love to see the presence of the police in our villages, Madam Speaker, looking smart in their uniforms, walking around, and being a friend of the society. But Madam Speaker, with this, this trend that we're taking these days, where we're even calling for violence against the police, Madam Speaker, we have, to, we have to be careful, Madam Speaker, how we approach this matter. Because if we have to, the police constantly under fear that the police are, are, are unable to walk, to walk through certain streets, Madam Speaker, that the police are afraid or, 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 or frightened in, because they're human beings into going to certain communities, Madam Speaker, because of the instructions that we give in those communities as to how to treat the police, Madam Speaker, all these are issues that probably the state has to consider because it's, it's, it's a threat, Madam Speaker, to the life and the security of those police officers um, and, and their families by extension, Madam Speaker. And so I believe that every time we get to speak about the police, every time we get to commend the police, Madam Speaker, it should be something positive, Madam Speaker. Too many times we, 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 we have the community believe that the police is the enemy of the state, Madam Speaker. And so we ask that action should be taken against the police because we probably see the police as enemies of the state. And many of us, Madam Speaker, in responsible positions, must be careful that we do not call for attacks against our police, Madam Speaker. Because their role, without their presence, Madam Speaker, this country could be in serious difficulties and serious challenges. Now, Madam Speaker, the issue of crime and, 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 and black-collar crime or blue-collar crime or, or, or blue-collar crime, and, and, and white collar crime, Madam Speaker, um, and electronic crime, and, and those things, Madam Speaker, they're even becoming a little more difficult to detect and to control and to police, Madam Speaker. And so I believe that, that, that what we can do, yes, while we're passing this, 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 this making this amendment, to ensure that the police are, are better covered um, with insurance, Madam Speaker, that is not the end of our support to the police, Madam Speaker. We have to give them moral support. We have to encourage them, Madam Speaker, to walk the streets by day and night without being fearful of stones or bottles or bombs or rocks or whatever missiles we can think of, Madam Speaker. We have to ensure that the policemen can walk and, and, and police our communities feeling safe and secure, Madam Speaker, in the performance of their duties, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we need to and this government has been very, very good to the police. I know the Minister for Police, so I cannot go into detail, but, but the Minister of, 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 of um, National Security, the Attorney General, the Prime Minister, can tell you the resources that we've made available to ensure that we make our policemen comfortable. Once because it's clear that, like the police, the nurses, the teachers, politicians, we cannot give them all that they ask for at the same time because we have limited resources to go around, Madam Speaker. But the best we can do for all public service, um, 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 all, 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 all public servants, Madam Speaker, the police in particular, we have attempted um, um, decent accommodation, we provide with transportation, and, and, and those sort of things, Madam Speaker. We would like, we wish that we could do it on a larger scale, but we're doing what we can do, and we spend significant sums, Madam Speaker, in ensuring that our police officers are properly treated, properly taken care of, and well taken care of, Madam Speaker. But the most we can do as, as policymakers, as, as, as a leadership of this country in all forms, Madam Speaker, is to encourage the communities to respect 
our police officers and to give the police officers the comfort that they require that they can go back to how it used to be in the days, Madam Speaker, when you could walk and all you could get is a smile and away from the police and you feel secure that the police is in our community. I want the police in my community to patrol the streets and to ensure that law and order is maintained throughout, Madam Speaker. But if the police have to be constantly under threat, if, if they have to be constantly under stress, that they have to be coming out there because they are threats to block the airport and they are threats to block Pegua and they are threats to go down on the port. Madam Speaker, this is not helping, Madam Speaker. And this is, so no matter how much insurance coverage that you give to the police officers, Madam Speaker, they must feel comfortable, they must feel welcome, and they must feel welcome and, and appreciated, Madam Speaker, for the sacrifices that they make and the sacrifices that their family make to ensure that we can maintain and retain a stable and a comfortable community that we all may be able to live in. So Madam Speaker, with this brief intervention, I want to support the amendment and, and, and to say that we are a friendly government, we are friends of the police, Madam Speaker, and we'll continue to do everything we can within our limited resources to ensure that we can make the lives of our police officers much more comfortable and much safer all across the country, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, just to simply say that I'm happy that we, we're here in the Parliament to amend the legislation to allow for the uh, new insurance company to, to be set in. And what we have done with this amendment is to uh, ensure that in the future we will not need an amendment of the Act if there is a need for there to be a change of, a change of insurance company. That will be done by an SRO um, because had we had this in place before, we would have been able to sign on to the new insurance company. But uh, because the law, as the Minister for National Security highlighted, the law was specific to a particular insurance company, in order for the Cabinet to, to make that change, we had to come to the Parliament. And I want to thank the police and the Police Welfare Association and the Attorney General's Office and the Minister for National Security staff for the various um, opportunities we had on, for consultation. Because it is always the desire of this government to ensure that where the health insurance of police, and not only of the police officers themselves, because the policy will also, is also covering their family members, because these people are among the first responders, and they are there in difficult circumstances, you don't want them thinking, you know, if my daughter falls sick, how am I going to take care of her health care? So these things are important from a psychological standpoint and also from a financial standpoint as well. Because health care these days in the world, Dominica included, um, is prohibitive for many families. The, the, the sheer cost of these basic surgeries these days, you know, if you compare this to 15 or 20 years ago, I mean, you're talking about significant costs. And... Um, and, and therefore, these things are important for, for every family. And this is why even from a broader national context, this is why we've been seeking to implement the National Health Insurance Scheme. But with small populations like ours, you know, it always poses a challenge to implement. And therefore, the government took a decision to introduce two, uh, one, first of all, the pilot uh, health insurance scheme. And about a year or two ago, ago we increased the age coverage um, for a number of families. And this has been working very well where a number of families are able to benefit. Of course, with the advent of the new national hospital and the introduction of a number of new services at the hospital, we will see a reduction in the need for Dominicans to have to go overseas for some of the medical interventions which are currently going out for. And of course, with a number of trained specialists, who will be completely resident in Dominica, both in the public and private sectors, in the health, health system, we believe we'll be in a better position with, with advanced equipment, modern equipment, um, uh, and ad additional services. Um, we will see a reduction in the need for us to be able to, to, for the need for us to go overseas. And all of these things, you know, are evolving. You know, uh, 30 years ago, there were, there was not a high incidence of cancers we see in our country. Um, 30 years ago, the high incidence of 
hypotension and the uh, associated health risk of hypotension w wasn't there because the fact is we had a few motor cars in Dominica 30 years ago. Um, people walked, you see what I'm saying? Um, people eat differently. Once you get up in the ladder, then to go and squeeze a grapefruit or a lime, my brother, now, or, or, to, or to peel a sour sop and to take out the seeds and to blend it, people find that that is too tedious. They, it's easier for them to go to the shop and buy two boxes of juice, 1% um, juice and then 90% sugar, because people have money. You see what I'm saying? People have money, they can buy that. Um, people don't cut the greens anymore. There's nobody has a lot of spinach in their yard and they, they cut two, two, two branches and they cook for lunch and they, and, and they do that. People buy the, the, the can and beans in the tin and open that, put it in the microwave, you have lunch, voila. You, you, you see what I'm saying? So, the, and these things have a high, high sodium, high sodium, even the water we drink, man, the bottled water, it is better to drink tap water. We have to be careful because if you're hypertensive, there are some waters with high in sodium. Now, one bottle won't affect you, but if every day, like, give, me a give me a bottle of water, my brother, and you're drinking bottled water every day, not recognizing that the sodium level is high, it will spike your, your um, blood pressure. And with a spiked blood pressure, you know, uh, you know what the results are. And, and therefore, we, while we will continue to improve on the healthcare, to, to minimize on the need for, um, for um, overseas intervention, but health insurance is always an important thing to have, like um, your insurance, your properties. Nobody knows when a hurricane will hit you. So yes, you pay in insurance every year and, and, and nothing happens to your house and saying, by this year, and we're going to cover my insurance. And back, two days later, Maria came. Blow your roof. Damage everything inside there. Where do you get the money to fix it? So, so, so these things sometimes appear to be not important because of our experiences, but it's important for us to have an insurance. And what is an insurance? You know, in the event. And I will say to the police that this is not a simple investment. This is a, this is a massive investment in the welfare of not only the police officers, but the families. And I will dare say, Madam Speaker, and the records are there to show that I am the Prime Minister, Madam Speaker, who has invested the most in the police. The most. The most. And outside of the, of the material investment, I have been the one who has shown the most respect to the police as a prime minister. The most respect and admiration. You know, we've seen in the past, Madam Speaker, where a government came in and went on, 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 a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a witch hunt because they didn't like a few police officers, went and, and destroyed these police officers and their families. And, and their way of life. You don't, you don't do that to people, Madam Speaker. You don't do that to people. You may have a, a disagreement, let us deal with disagreement di differently. But to, to, to want to burn the building, you know, just to, just to destroy two people, it, it's not right. And, and what was done in the 90s to these um, police officers and their families, I believe, Madam Speaker, that at some point, the state needs to apologize to these people for what they've done to, to these police officers and their families. You know, similarly, you know, destroying a whole Dominica Banana Growers Association. You know, just to get hold of one person, Mr. Scotland. You know, how do you do that? How do you come to a parliament and pass a legislation to, to, to disband an organization that was benefiting thousands of farmers and their families because you don't like one person? Power and authority must never be used that way. Never be used that way. The Constitution gives a government and the Prime Minister in particular, tremendous powers, Madam Speaker. Tremendous powers. You ask me, I believe too much powers. Seriously. If you will ask me objectively from a philosophical, ideological standpoint, I believe the Constitution gives the Prime Minister too much power. But that has to be used judiciously. It has to be used carefully. It must never be used to try to destroy people and their families and their way of life. It must always be used to, up, to bring people up and to raise people, Madam Speaker. And this is what has been my way of conducting the affairs of the country. Yes, I will. I, I am a politician and I will deal with things sometimes from a political standpoint, but never to try to destroy people, use the power of, of the Prime Minister or use the majority of the Parliament to come to Parliament to pass legislation to destroy somebody. And, and, and that person cannot reside in Dominica because his daily bread has been taken away from him. He has to take his family and go overseas. And this is not, this is not what we're doing. Anymore. Our respect for the police and when, and this is why I see the chairman of the Police Rape Association and I will say to him publicly too, I was disappointed that the Police Welfare Association did not condemn 
Mr. Linton when he, he, he asked people to throw stones on the police. You know, we must, we must never tolerate this thing where, where somebody in leadership is saying to the people to place the lives of the police in danger. And the, the entire country, Madam Speaker, should have condemned that, that action. The entire country. Because when stones come down like rain, it doesn't decide on whose head it falls. It falls on, on, on everybody's head. You can't say, okay, well, Mr. Mister, okay, Mr. I don't Mr. 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 That's how it is. When it comes, and we have to, we have to watch these things. And, I, and I've always maintained, Madam Speaker, respect for these institutions, respect for people who form those institutions, um, and an appreciation for the extraordinary work that the police do in this country. Not only police officers, but nurses, teachers, the entire public, Madam Speaker. We will never be able to agree on everything. We'll never be able to get everything because the state can only do what the state, with the resources the state has. The state doesn't have two, two or three treasuries. They have one treasury. And the revenue of the state comes from taxes. Taxes and other non-tax um, um, opportunities, like sell, uh, sale of state assets and others. But how much assets the state has to sell? When, when you sell land, people take a long time to pay you. You, you see what I'm saying? So, I am happy to be here. I did, in fact, meet with the police at the police headquarters, and I said to the leadership of the police and to the Police Rebel Association, once they agreed to the amendment, if we have to come to Parliament in an emergency session to pass the Parliament, to pass the law, we'll do so. And I also made a commitment to them that in the intervening period where there was no insurance and the amendment to the law, the, God, the, the Treasury of Dominica, by instruction of the Minister of Finance, we will cover any police officer or any family member who will require help here, Madam Speaker. And, and we don't play games with people's lives like this, you know. This is a serious matter, and I'm very happy that we're able to come here today. Um, you know, I heard somebody said that they came here to, to speak on behalf of the police. Um, but interesting that they found reasons to go, you know. And this is not how you conduct business, you know. Madam Speaker, when you go to these ministerial meetings at CARICOM or OAS, and you go to these heads of government meetings, Madam Speaker, it can be, it, it, it is fierce discussions, you know. Fierce discussions. I have seen where two heads of state, you know, stood up right next to each other, you know, Madam Speaker, brace up to fight. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, this thing is a serious thing. And if you don't have the, the discipline of, of, of restraint and respect for the other person, then you may end up in, in, in a fight in the carry committee, Madam Speaker. I have seen prime ministers almost stand on it on, 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 on tables and, and make noise and so on. And you know, and you, you have to find a way of cooling the temperature. You, you see what I'm saying? Thank God for me, Madam Speaker. I am a cool fellow, so and so. I always find myself uh, uh, as an arbiter and, and somebody trying to make peace and so on and, and, and otherwise. Um, but good. I mean, the senator made an issue here. A motion was moved to have him suspended for the, for the session. We went out, Madam Speaker suspended the house, we went out, we're trying to get the guy to come back and say, okay, my brother, let's come back to the house. We will move a motion to rescind the decision that we took, but apologize to the Speaker, apologize to the house, refuse to apologize. And if somebody is refusing to apologize, beware, beware of these people. Because there is, there is no, there is no semblance of humility by people who cannot apologize. Apologizing, Madam Speaker, is one of, should be one of the simplest things we can do as human beings. Because it speak, you can only be forgiven if you apologize, if you ask for forgiveness. And that's biblical. That's biblical. And to not have the, the, the maturity, the maturity to simply say, my brother, I'm sorry, and, and finish with that. It speaks volumes about a human being. Yes. And all of these things, we in Dominica must take note of. That if you lack humility, when you, you, if somebody lacks humility and you bring them up, mm -hmm. if you have no... Because the, the higher you go, Madam Speaker, in life, the more you, of humility you must have. And if you're there and you have none, my brother, when you get up there, people dead. People dead. 
So I want to commend the leadership of the minister, Honorable Blackmore, for, for really pushing this. He, being a police officer, knows very well the challenges of the police force and the issues there, and he's been doing a, a good job in representing the interests of the police. And I will say to the police, Many times I have to tell Black, well, look, my brother, you're not a police officer, you're not a brother, you're a, police officer, you're a minister. So, so, so why he might have a few rough edges and, and there, but we must not lose sight of the fundamental part of his contribution, and he's watching out for the police officer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I just rise to say one or two words, really simply to support this bill. I think it would be remiss of me as someone who served in the police service of this country not to uh, place on record formally my support for the bill. Um, and certainly in terms of the um, efforts made by the government over many years uh, to support and provide for the police, Madam Speaker, I'm not aware in the years that the Lord has blessed me to be on this earth of any government that has supported the police service more than this current government has done in terms of transportation, in terms of accommodation, in terms of training, in terms of every aspect that I can think of. Uh, the government has supported the police um, significantly and continues to do so. <coughs> Madam Speaker, this bill um, which provides for or proposes to provide for a proper medical uh, coverage medical insurance coverage for police officers in light of the mishap that existed previously it is to be commended and I commend it in that vein. Thank you, Madam. Madam Speaker, I'm very, very happy for the police. I'm very happy for the police. Um, but I think, Madam Speaker, it's, it's, a, it's such a shame that one of these very important measures has been presented to this Honorable House that not one member of, of, of the other side saw it appropriate to come and speak on behalf of the police. And, Madam Speaker, we must condemn that. Madam Speaker, I, I, I listened to some people within the public domain after the pronouncement was made that this amendment was going to be brought before the Senate of the House. And some people say, why not me? Why the police? Madam Speaker, the most fundamental function of the state is to provide for the safety of its people and the upholding of the, of the laws of this country or of any country. And the police is charged with that fundamental responsibility. There's a saying that while others are asleep, the police walk the street at night, on the rain, on the lightning. It brings with it, Madam Speaker, tremendous hardship and risk. And I speak from a, from a perspective of knowing something, Madam Speaker. In the days, in the days Madam Speaker, within the CID, we pack our vehicles and we walk up to the Castle Comfort, Nubia, etc., and then we hit the bayside under the moonlight and search every boathouse. It's a very risky and challenging job. I can re re recall, Madam Speaker, being a police, even when I re returned from studies, working with the Welfare Association on fundamental issues, including this amendment, which uh, incidentally, Madam Speaker, was effected in 1997. And this, this, this amendment, therefore, not only simplifies the law, but Madam Speaker makes it easier for, as the Prime Minister rightly said, and the, and the Attorney General, for, for the government, along with the police, to actually um, shop for, shop for com the most competitive and best coverage for, the, for police officers. I want to just say, Madam Speaker, that as we said in the introduction, by law, by law, police officers are entitled to free medical. I said that because there's a threshold on, on, on the coverage, and let us suppose this, this, this threshold is $300,000, and, and the medical procedure for the police is $2 million, $1 million. As we have seen in, in recent past, the instances where, for example, you have some real um, 
troublesome or intricate um, medical procedures and operations, the bill is close to $2 million. Where, the way it surpasses what the coverage provided by the insurance, and the state has to meet, has to meet, has to meet the cost. At no time, Madam Speaker, when a police officer has to be flown overseas and, and the permission of the Prime Minister is being sought, that, that he has said no. And that demonstrates, as I've said before, that this is a government for the police, Madam Speaker, and I'm proud to be part of, of, of this, this ex experience. And you heard the Prime Minister said something he says to me, you're no longer a police officer. I said, I, I, that, that is true, but it's very true, but I mean, sometimes knowing what the guys have to do. But Madam Speaker, I want to say something there. And I've said so whenever I interact with the Police Web Association, that the jobs bring with it some benefits too. And at all times, we have to ensure that we give the best service to the public. That we demonstrate the highest level of diligence in every aspect of our, of our job as police officers and as public servants and as servants to the state. And that is something I know most of the officers take very seriously. But I'll speak also in closing to say, and I, I want to say thank you to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet um, for the support that I've been given to the police. It's not easy. And also, I want to place on, on the record, Madam Speaker, for the um, administrative support provided by the Permanent Secretary, Aegis Chambers. And of course, I, I want to commend the Chief um, Draft Person for quickly responding. And I, I really appreciate um, the, the spirit in which the Prime Minister actually entered the discussion and to bring closure to this very fundamental issue. And to say that to the police, that the best is yet to come in terms of caring for you and providing for you. And you have to know who your, who your friends are. You have to know who your friends are. You have to know who your friends are. Look at that. Not one chair, you see not any one member of the, oppos of, of the opposition sitting. So I'm not saying that. The member proposed for uh, cottage, the senior minister, deputy prime minister, said it in graphic terms. But when I heard that, somebody singing, you see, and saying, Cool wash, not, not stone, you know. Cool wash will come down like stone, like rain. I said I want to put back my Polish woods, man. Can I, make a, can I make a statement like that and get away with it? So it brings to my mind that when certain utterances are placed within the proper domain, that all of us have a responsibility to ensure that those kind of actions and utterances are denounced in, in, in the clearest of terms. We, going forward, Madam Speaker, will engage in other interventions, get towards improving the condition of work for the police in terms of housing. Of course, I know that's something that's very close to the Prime Minister's heart, and my heart also, because we want to see I mean, a modern building actually installed just adjacent to police headquarters to actually provide accommodation for a minimum of 200 police officers. And that is why I've said, and I will say it again for emphasis, Madam Speaker, that this is the government for the police under the Labour Party administration. I'm not asking police officers to be politicians like me, we have to resign to do that. And to say further, um, we have in this year's um, financial cycle made, made provision for the construction of a new training school and, and one million dollars is actually put aside for that undertaking, Madam Speaker. So Madam Speaker, I, I want to close this debate by saying that I'm very happy that um, we have seen um, the conclusion of, of, of the negotiation, of course, and then the, the enacting um, shortly thereafter, Madam Speaker, of this very important amendment. Thank you very much. This concludes the debate, so I'm going to put it to the House. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled the Police Amendment Act of 2019 be read a second time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The bill will now be read a second time. Police Amendment Act 2019. The bill now stands committed to a committee of the whole house to be considered clause by clause.
House resumes, and I have to report that the bill shortly entitled the Police Amendment Act of 2019 passed the committee stage without amendment. The question is that the report of the committee on the bill be adopted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Madam Speaker, did I stand to pass? That's okay. Okay, that's no problem. It's becoming Speaker, customary. I, short, I said it's becoming customary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled the Police Amendment Act 2019 be read a third time and pass. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled the Police Amendment Act of 2019 be read a third time and passed. Police Amendment Act 2019. The bill has been read a third time and passed accordingly. And Speaker, I move that this Honorable House be adjourned, signed it I. Second, Madam Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that this Honorable House be adjourned, signed it die. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. This honorable house stands adjourned, signing die. Madam Speaker!